Good morning, Crossins. How's everybody doing this morning? Good morning. Good morning. Okay, that was good. That was really good. All right. Hey, welcome. Welcome to church today. Thank you guys for being with us online. Good morning. We love you. We thank you. Thank you for joining us. I am really excited to be here in church this morning. I don't know about y'all, but I am pumped yeah. to be in church. We're going to go ahead and get into our first song. So all the areas of the building, let's go ahead and get ready for church this morning. Everybody in the building this morning, go ahead and stand up. We're going to go ahead and pray before we get into our song. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you, God, for our, everything that you have done. Thank you for sending your son to die for us. Lord, we pray that in everything that we do, that it honor you, that the songs that we sing, sing for you, that the breath that we breathe, we breathe for you. And that in all that we do, Lord, we honor you. We pray all these things and all God's children say, amen. amen. Y'all ready to worship this morning? Yeah. All right, let's get into worship, y'all.
Good morning, Crosswinds Church. Go ahead and take your seat. I don't know about you guys, but it has been a very long week for me, and it feels like it just keeps going. But what a great reminder this song is that we have joy in the Lord. Amen? Amen. Well, my name is Riley Wolf. I'm one of the young adult co-leaders here at Crosswinds Church. Welcome in, everybody. If you are new, we want to make sure you feel welcome. Whether you are joining us online or in person for the first time, take a moment and fill out the Connect card found in front of you or online. We want to connect with you and answer any questions you may have. And don't forget to stop by our Next Step Center in the lobby. We have a gift waiting there just for you. And next Sunday, join us at our Step In Meet and Greet. This is a great place to connect with us if you're new. Well, you'll get a chance to meet the pastors, their wives, and other families here at Crosswinds Church. Lunch is provided and childcare is available. So let us know you're attending by at the Next Step Center or online. Now, our kids' camp is presents, presents a free shred event. There we go. If you have a pile of documents that just keep adding up at home and you need to get rid of, I know for me, I just drop all that off at my parents, but come on by on May 6th between 10 a.m. and 1 p.m. and get rid of it all in seconds. Donations will support our annual kids' camp program in July. So we got some good stuff for them. Also, our men's ministry, uh, they are getting ready to learn how to lead and live God's way. There we go. We should all do that. But they are going through a study in 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Starting next Tuesday, May 9th, and Saturday's Bible study will continue through the book of Hebrews at 7 a.m., and on the first Sunday of every month, we invite you to participate in First Fruits Sunday. Inspired by Exodus 23:16, our Brotherhood Pantry uh, will be displayed on the patio where you may donate or take non-perishable foods and hygiene items. And what a great opportunity to be able to bless someone who needs help from your world or simply uh, to provide uh, for your own home as well. These resources will also be available in the conference room during the week uh, through office hours. And if you have any questions about anything coming up or would like more information or to sign up for anything, be sure to visit our Next Step Center in the lobby on the website uh, or through the app. And of course, Thank you all to the giving you guys do here. If you would like to give, you can give at our giving boxes at the back doors or online. Let's continue singing praises to our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and worship the God of the universe. And in your presence, there's fullness of joy. You are here in our presence, Lord. We worship you.
Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you work it. Even when I don't feel it, you work it. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. You are the ruler of this universe, ruler of all nations. Holy forever you are. Oh, how we worship you this morning.
You are righteous. You are merciful. You are loving, God. And you are worthy to be praised this morning. Worthy to be praised.
are worthy. Worthy is your name forever. And you will be a lamb upon the throne. And this morning we gladly bow our knees to worship you. Please be seated. Father, we want to hear from you this morning. Would you speak to us? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart truly, Lord, be pleasing in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. And we, we anticipate hearing from you now. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Many years ago, a band uh, had a top 10 song that has uh, since be, uh, been used in probably any number of commercials. And it went like this. You'll recognize this, some of you anyway. Get out on the highway, looking for adventure. Uh, for whatever comes my way, I can't forget the... Anyway, <laughs> but I will say the, the, uh, the bridge went like this. Like a true nature's child, you were born, born to be wild. We can climb so high, I never want to die. And then all together, born to be wild. Now, that wasn't a Christian band. That's not a Christian song. The, the lyrics were pretty thought-provoking, if you ever heard the lyrics or if you thought about them. Essentially, what the song is saying is, I don't want to be like everybody else. I, don't, I, I want to be different from other people. I was born to be wild and free. And you know something? For us Christians, I would say that these sentiments aren't all that different. We, we're not born to be like everybody else. We are reborn to be different from others. We are to be wild and free from this world. I love the song, my, one of my favorite songs that if we wanted to take up a, an anthem for us as Christians is, uh, this world is not my home, I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And you know, we see this idea quite often in scripture in John 15. John says this, if you, are, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. Romans 12, 2 reminds us, Don't not, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Peter reminds us who we are in this world. Beloved, I urge you as foreigners and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. And then John again, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if all of this is true, and it is, if I'm not of this world, if I am an alien, if I'm a stranger, if I'm just passing through then why do I love this world so much sometimes? Why, how come my behaviors and my attitudes seem to look just like the people who are around me? And many of you know, my, my dog of many years, Cooper, passed away a few weeks ago. And one of the things about Cooper was uh, I, I provide a really good environment for my dogs. And we have a nice big backyard. They have plenty of room to run back there and frolic and play. But for some reason, some dogs, and Cooper was one of them, 
just decided that the backyard isn't enough. Even though I'm a little dog in a great big yard and I've got friends and I've got food and I have everything I need, this isn't enough. I'm going to get out of this yard. I'm going to dig under. I'm going to go over. I'm going to do whatever I can to get out of there. And what did I have to do eventually? I had to put a guy wire back in the backyard and chain him up so he wouldn't get out until he learned that he needs to stay in the yard. And when Jesus calls us, he calls us to a life of freedom. Galatians 5.1 tells us it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. But that freedom has limits for our own good. God cares for us. And that's what he is getting at today as we continue in the book of Matthew in our series, His Kingdom Come. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you, turn to Matthew chapter 6 as we continue on where we left off last week in verse 19. I encourage you to take out the note cards that you got at the door. Take some notes this morning. If you didn't get a card, then put your hand up. We'll make sure you get one of those. There are questions on the back of that card that our life groups will be uh, using this week. Week. Feel free to use those on your own. If you uh, are joining with us online today, welcome. And all of the material I talked about is available to you on our church app as well. This morning, <laughs> I've entitled the message, No Worries. <laughs> have you noticed like I have that that phrase has become popular? I've asked a couple of people, what do you mean by that? <laughs> and, and really, in essence, it's just a, a, a and, and another way of saying no problem or don't think about it or forget about it, right? If you're, fr if you're from uh, where uh, Richie lives right? or lived, right? <laughs> no worries. You know, it's, it's no big deal. Don't, don't worry about it. And, uh, of course, there was a, a certain meerkat and warthog that, you know, sang a whole song about having no worries in life. And in a sense, Jesus is going to kind of get there this morning. These past few weeks as he has been teaching us in this passage known as the Sermon on the Mount, he's been teaching us and demonstrating to us, if you've been with us, you've heard this. If not, uh, feel free to go online. All of the, the messages are uh, recorded there for you. But that he shares with us, been sharing with us, that we are to be different in our behavior, particularly different at, from the religious leaders who he often used as the example of what not to do. Kind of sad when you think about it. The religious leaders, the ones that are supposed to be the examples, are instead the examples of what not to do. And as we've seen over and over again, quite often they were hypocrites. Their, their behaviors didn't match their words. And Jesus would use them and say, your righteousness needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We are to be different in our praying, different in our fasting. We are to, ha we are to be different in how we re view our relationships in how we make oaths, how we make promises. We, we talk about behaving differently. Think about it. We are to love our enemies. We're to pray for them even. We are to give in secret knowing that God will see it. We are to forgive as God has forgiven us. And today he doesn't let up. He's going to get very practical. No, let's be honest. It's going to get very uncomfortable, I think, for some of us. He's going to kind of meddle today. He's going to talk about that taboo subject. Now, I know some of you are thinking, sex? No, no, no. Come on. We don't live in a, in a society where sex is a taboo subject anymore. We talk about it all the time. It's out there uh, for everybody who wants to see it. No, the taboo subject for us today is money, right? I'll tell you all about my sex life, but boy, you ask me how much money I make, who do you think you are? Okay? <laughs> He's going to talk about our money and our possessions today. You see, we often have this idea that the world is divided into the spiritual world and the material world, right? And that's why I can come to church and I can praise God and, and be very spiritual. But then when I get out in the, quote, real world, where my job is, where real people are, well, I don't necessarily have to follow the, the, the spiritual world stuff. Jesus doesn't say that. In fact, Jesus made it very clear that our attitude towards our money, as we're going to see today meaning the material world, is in fact the mark of our true spirituality. It's the mark of how much we actually trust in God. 
You see, the Pharisees, they believed and they taught that the Lord blessed those people that he loved with finances and with with material blessings and possessions. And sadly, many preachers still teach that, that this is how God shows his favor. And if you don't have those things, you've done something wrong. You've you've angered God. You, You are deserving. You are entitled to these blessings. And because of that, the Pharisees often looked for ways to gain more money, to gain more things. Now, right at the start, I want to emphasize here, because it's going to get a little uncomfortable for some of us, and I include myself, but I want to emphasize here, there is nothing wrong in money and things themselves. In fact, God has given us everything to enjoy. 1 Timothy 6.17 tells us this, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Jesus wants us to see today that it is not wrong to possess things as long as those things don't possess us. Jesus today is going to respond to, I think, some statements that many of us would have to admit that, yeah, I've said that. I've made that statement. For instance, haven't we all at some time or another said something like this? I am struggling with my finances. What does Jesus say to that? (laughs) No worries. Look at verse 19 of of Matthew 6. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. First off, let's let's make some definitions here. What are these treasures that he's talking about? Well, the context here is our money and on in our possessions. But in a in a much greater sense, it's more than that. It's also bringing people to Christ. It's being obedient to God. What has Jesus been talking about? Don't pray. Don't give. Don't fast. Don't serve. Only to be seen by other people. We've seen that already. Because if you do, he says, you have your reward. Why? Because you stored that particular treasure, whatever it is, you stored it here on earth. The bottom line is, storing up my treasures in heaven is being a good steward. You realize that? We are stewards. We're not owners. I may have stuff, and I do. I mean, as, and in fact... Generally, we Americans, we people in the first world, we we do pretty well. And sometimes we start to be thinking things like, this is my stuff. I own all this stuff. And yet scripture never teaches that. Scripture teaches us that rather I am a steward. I manage the stuff that I have. God has allowed me to have a certain amount of finances and a certain amount of stuff. And it's my responsibility to use those, to invest those for his kingdom. And it means that all that I have and all that I am is here to glorify God. And notice this, in each case, I love this about this passage here, in each case you are storing up for yourself. If it's money, I can put it in the bank down the street or I can invest it in the bank of heaven. And in a sense, what he's saying here is money invested in the, in the Lord's work is going to be legal tender when I get to heaven. Now, I know some people will say, well, that's not a very good reason to motive to give. I I mean, you, you give money now because I'm going to get it back in heaven. But isn't that what Jesus is saying? We all know that phrase, right? You can't take it with you. And yet some people treat money and things like that's exactly what they're planning to do. Years ago, the advice columnist Ann Landers had this letter written to her. She says, Dear Ann Ladders, uh, the letter that came from the woman who was married to the tightwad, she couldn't get an extra quarter out of him. That reminded me of my wonderful aunt who was beautifully warm-hearted and had a great sense of humor. Aunt Emma was married also to a tightwad who was also a little bit strange. He made a good salary, but they lived frugally because he insisted on putting 20% of his paycheck under the mattress. The man didn't trust banks. 
The money, he said, was going to come in handy in their old age. So when Uncle Ollie was 60, he was stricken with cancer, and towards the end, he made Aunt M promise in the presence of his brothers that she would put the money he had stashed away into his coffin so that he could buy his way into heaven if he had to. They all knew this was a little odd, but this was clear, and it was clearly a crazy request. But Aunt M did promise, and she assured Uncle Ollie's brothers that she was a woman of her word, and she would do as she asked. And sure enough, fo the following morning, she took the money, which by now was many tens of thousands of dollars. She took it to the bank, deposited it, wrote a check, and put it into the casket. <laughs> and so he still didn't take it with him. <laughs> And while it's true that we can't take it with us, based on what Jesus is saying here, it would seem that we can send it on ahead. What does he say? Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Why should we do this? Verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's human nature, is it not, for us to be focused on our treasure, to be careful. But, but I would encourage you, be careful when you focus on your things. For many, uh, you don't own them. And you know that probably, right? They, you don't own them. They own you. That house that you have, it's nice, but uh, it takes up a lot of your time. It, it requires things of you. That car, you got to keep feeding it to make it go. It, it breaks down. It, it, you don't own them anymore. They own you. The point here is, if I invest in something, I am interested in what it's doing. If I'm invested in banks or in stocks or in my business, then I'm interested in what they are doing. I am focusing on that. If my investment, as Jesus says here, is in heaven, then I'm going to be thinking about heaven. Do you see what Jesus is saying here? When you go to the church app in order to give, when you, when you stop by the boxes there and drop your, uh, your envelope in on your way out, that is not God's way of raising cash, guys. That is God's way of raising you. Ooh, that's good. It's not God's way of raising money. That's God's way of raising you. Don't you think that it's interesting that he doesn't say where your heart is, there your treasure will be? If I have a heart for something, I'm going I'm, I'm to uh, focus on it, right? If you have a heart for our church, you're, you're going to give to our church. You're going to want to see it. If you have a heart for a certain charity or, or, or maybe one of your grandchildren or something like that, you're going to give to them. And yet that's not what he says. Why? Because Jesus knows us. He knows that oftentimes we're hypocrites. I can say that I, I love God and actually not really demonstrate that at all. But he says instead, where we put our time and our money, that's the real test. We can say anything we want. The real test is what are you actually doing? So every time I give to the Lord and to his work, I'm also giving away just a little bit of my selfishness, just a little bit of my stinginess. And I am reminded once again who it belongs to anyway and why I have it. Look at verse 22. The eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. So if then the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? What Jesus is doing here is describing spiritual vision, if you will, the kind of vision we should have. Throughout the Old Testament, the eye is indicative of the direction of your life. A clear eye was often focused, or was in fact, focused upon God, who is uh, referred to as light, the father of lights. The first great creation of his was light. On the other extreme, a bad eye was focused on yourself. And that's kind of greedy. That's, that's covetous. There's no light emanating just from me other than what the Lord has put there. Here Jesus is showing how the eye that allows light in as we focus on God because he is the source of light is a good thing for us. But if your eye is bad, if your eye is instead focused on yourself, there's no light coming into that eye. You live in darkness. You're spiritually blind, and you will and do stumble at the very least. 
The religious leaders had this problem. Their their spiritual eyes, if you will, were bad. They were focused on themselves. They coveted money. They coveted wealth. So they were in darkness and they were failing in their service to God. Jesus is calling us to an undivided loyalty, to a total devotion here with eyes that are fixed upon him. In Hebrews 11, we have the great hall of faith where he talks about the great, great men and women of the faith, Abraham and Jacob and others. And after that, in Hebrews 12, starting in verse 1, it says this, Therefore, since we also have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let's rid ourselves of every obstacle and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let's run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking only at Jesus Christ the originator and perfecter of the faith. Guys, it only makes sense because look at verse 24. No one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and wealth. Did you catch what what he said there? Wealth, guys, it's not just your money. Jesus says, it is your master, and you are serving it. You say, I don't think so. Are you worried about it? (laughs) Do you worry about your finances quite often? Do you think if I just had more, everything would be okay? You're serving it. That's what that is. Ever try to put one eye on one thing and one eye on another? Some of us are able to cross our eyes. It's been a long time since I did it, but this past week I thought, can I still do that? Yep, I still can. And I can hear my mom when I do that. Don't do that. They'll grow that way. <laughs> That's not a bad comment. You think about it. If you, if, if you spend too much time looking at two different things, yeah, you will become used to that. They will kind of grow that way. Even mom, <laughs> even mom, even mom knows that's no way to live, right? You can't see straight. It will make you sick if you try to stay that way too much longer. It's no way to live. And so what does mom do? They put a patch over one of your eyes to correct that. That's what Jesus wants. He wants our total devotion, our total view. In Revelation 3, he says, I'd rather that you were hot or cold, but since you're lukewarm, another way of saying I'm trying to do two things at once, since you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That kind of life, that kind of behavior makes God sick. Have one single devotion. That's what he's getting here. It's the only way. Let me give you a suggestion, by the way, in case you need it, on which to choose, God or wealth. You know that dollar that you have in your pocket? It's not worth near a dollar anymore. Have you noticed that? And it's getting less and less worth a dollar. As the years go by, I did a little research this week, and you talk about the purchasing power of your dollar. It's not encouraging, guys. (laughs) That dollar that you have is not going to be, I was going to say it's not going to be worth a dollar next year. It's probably not going to be worth a dollar next week. So where are you going to put your your faith? Is it going to be in God or your money? There's only one answer that even makes sense. Jesus continues, and it's closely tied to financial worries that maybe you've said the second statement. What about my stuff? To which Jesus says, no worries. Verse 25, for this reason, he says, I say to you, don't be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you would drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? When he says here not to worry... He's not saying you don't need to plan. He said, you know, it's necessary to plan that you're going to have enough to eat, that you're going to be able to clothe yourself, that you're going to take care of your family. In fact, the church in Thessalonica, they had a problem. They had people, I mean, we have our, 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 our brotherhood pantry, we have our brotherhood uh, uh, funds, and we're able to help people. And in the church in Thessalonica, there were people that were taking advantage of that. There were people that figured out, hey, if I... If I just get from the church, I don't actually have to work. Paul had something to say about them. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, he said, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. (laughs) These are not the parts of the Bible we often preach on, right? 
For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busy bodies. <laughs> so it is important to work. It's important to do what you need to do to take care of yourself. But Jesus here is saying in verse 25, not to worry about these things. And it's interesting, the origin of that word that is used there for worry is strangle. And that is, is that not what happens when we worry? It strangles us. It ties me into knots. Why is that? Because when I'm worrying about something, there's a couple of things happening. Number one, I am not trusting God. And number two, I am substituting fear for actually doing something productive. Instead, I'm just worrying about it. And in the end of all the worrying, nothing has changed. It hasn't gotten any better. And Jesus illustrates here beautifully what he is saying. Verse 26, he says, Look at the birds of the sky, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more important than birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add a single day to his life's span? And why are you worried about clothing? Notice how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor. They do not spin thread for cloth. And yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all of his glory clothed himself like one of these flowers. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? If you spend a a bit of time watching birds. I don't know if we have any bird watchers here, but uh, I'm not one, but I, I do see birds. And one thing I notice about them is that they're working all the time to find food you know, or they're making their nests or they're doing whatever. And, and frankly, most of them don't store up food. Why is that? Because there's going to be food again tomorrow. <laughs> That's the way birds are wired. The, the, I need food for today and then tomorrow I'll get some more food. And how do flowers grow? Well, they grow through this natural process. I, personally, I am terrible with plants. Plants come to our house to die. My, <laughs> that's one of the things Jackie and I share. We cannot make plants grow. I, I, I apologize to them when we bring one home. I'm sorry about this, but, you know, maybe you'll be different. But it, it just doesn't work for us. And yet... The hills behind our house are covered with poppies. We went out when we were on vacation a couple of weeks ago, and we saw some of the poppy blooms. And, and nobody went out there and planted those flowers. They're just there. Well, God put them there. And we often think more money and more things are going to solve the problems that I have. And then only we find out they bring more problems, more worry, more anxiety. And it's robbing us of our joy, joy that the birds and the flowers already possess. Here's the bottom line, guy, guys. What Jesus is saying here is that all of nature depends upon God, and God never fails it. Amen. You know, up until this year, and some of you that are longtime Californians like me, you know, all the doomsayers were like, this is it, California's done for, never going to rain again. And you know, I mean, it's like... It was all of that, and I'm like, you know, people would say that to me, and I'd say, I've, look, I've been here all my life. That's a long time now. It's going to rain again, and trust me, when it rains again, it's going to rain good, and it does, and it did, and that's because God will take care of his creation. Only men, only people like me and you, we depend on our money and our possessions, which have demonstrated over and over again that they are going to fail us, guaranteed. Some of the richest people in all of history, guys like Howard Hughes and others, when, when they were interviewed at the end of their life, you know, has all your riches, there's an actual famous interview with Howard Hughes, has all of your riches made you happy in life? And his answer was one word, no. Is the richest man of all. And yet, I stupidly think, man, if I just had some more money, things would be good. And let's be honest, a lot of us think that, right? You know, life is good. I just could use some more, some more money, and, and then things will be even be better. I get it. I get it, Willie. Okay, stop worrying. Don't be anxious. That's great advice. I'm convinced. But how? How do I make that work for me? Well, I'm glad you asked. 
Peter says it this way, 1 Peter 5, he says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you at the proper time, having cast all your anxiety on him because he cares about you. Humble yourself. I, I think sometimes people need to be reminded, what is humility? You know, we got this idea that humility is, uh, you know, thinking of yourself, oh, I'm a worm, you know, I'm going to get a whip and I'm going to whip myself. I'm going to, you know, there, there's a whole doctrine uh, the, uh, of mortifying the flesh, Right? And I'm going to beat myself down, and, and somehow I'm going to make myself humble. Well, that's not how you become humble. You don't, you don't become humble by thinking less of yourself than you are. You're actually pretty valuable. You're actually pretty hot stuff. God sent his son to die for you. But you don't become humble by thinking, thinking less of yourself. Why? Because you're still thinking of yourself. You become humble by focusing everything on someone or something else. In this case, of course, it's Jesus Christ. I think the greatest example of humility was one time at a campground where I was, I was bringing a bus into the campground, and this mother's daughter was, was playing in the field, and I saw her there, but I'm, I'm driving the bus in. The mother didn't know I saw their daughter, and she happened to look up. She sees her daughter. She sees that big bus. What do you think she did? Did she think, oh my, if I run out there, I could get hit by that bus. Yeah, but there's my daughter. No, she didn't, she didn't do any thinking whatsoever. She got up and she ran into the path of this bus in order to rescue her daughter. That, I submit to you, is complete humility right there. She had no thought of her own self. And, and good parents all do that, right? We would all do that. Good husbands and wives, we would all do that. We don't, we don't calculate what's going to cost me or, what, or how am I going to get hurt. We just do it. And that's what humility is. So as we humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, it goes back to what we've already seen, putting our faith, putting our view on Jesus Christ, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Philippians 4, 6 says it this way, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Again, we looked at it last week. We, 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 if we want to have this relationship with God, go to him with it. Explain it. If you're struggling with the things that he's talking about today, go to the Lord. Explain that to him. He, he knows it already, as we saw last week. But the issue is, do we know it? Is it out there in the open so we can work on it? Again, there's nothing wrong with money. There's nothing wrong with stuff. As long as you don't take the, as they don't take the place of God, they should be tools for us to use, not the goal of our lives. And when we talk about money and worry and anxiety, there's one main area that it shows up in, and that's our final statement this morning. Is this familiar? I don't know what's coming. <laughs> The future, 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 all right? And what does Jesus say? You figured out what he says yet? No worries. <laughs> Verse 31, don't worry then saying, what are we to eat or what are we to drink or what are we to wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things and for your heavenly father knows that you need all these things. And what do all of these things that he's talking about here have in common? They're all about worrying about the future. And that worry, again, folks, is strangling us. It's keeping us from doing something actually constructive other than just worrying. It's like that old saying, today is the tomorrow that you worried about yesterday. <laughs> and if you think about it, quite often all you did was worry about it, didn't accomplish anything. So what should we be doing? Well, like Jesus says, your heavenly father knows that you need all of these things. Verse 32, but verse 33, he says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be provided to you. This seeking is something he says here that is continual. To seek his kingdom means to submit to God here and now and work for the future coming of his kingdom. Do this first means total loyalty to him and total commitment to him. Does that sound familiar? If you seek God first, guys, he says here, everything else will fall into place. I like that. 
I, I like lists of one. Just do this. Seek me first and everything will be added. And what is that? What are the things that are going to be added? Verse 31, our food, our drink, our clothing. That's the, that's the context that he's talking about here. It all comes to us whether we worry about it or not. I love the quote from Mark Twain. He says, I have spent most of my life worrying about things that never happened. I've seen many troubles in my time, half of which never came true. I mean, I don't know about you, but I feel like I have wasted a tremendous amount of time after, and I do it. I worry about things, and I've spent time worrying about it and, and, and figuring out what am I going to do about this, only to find out it never happened. It didn't come true. It wasn't, the, it wasn't real to begin with. And if you think about it, most of us here today are proof of what Twain says. We've all had those sleepless nights, right, worrying about that thing. And what did it accomplish? And yet, here we are today. We still made it. We're still alive. We're still kicking, all right? And most of us, I didn't see anybody walk here. Maybe you did for your health. But I think we've got cars. We put gas in them, no matter how much it costs. If I, what if I had trusted God right from the start and avoided all of that worry and all of that anxiety? Wouldn't we be so much better off? And that's how Jesus finishes up this morning. Verse 34. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And that's only common sense. Worrying about tomorrow doesn't help tomorrow or today. So you've wasted time. You've wasted energy doing nothing more than worrying about it. There's an old saying that I find to be pretty true. The average person is crucified between two thieves. The regrets of yesterday and the worries about tomorrow. The sad thing is it's not just worrying about what's coming. There's also those people that, that have regrets about where they've been. Let me be clear on both counts. The vast majority of us here, hopefully all of us, know Jesus Christ as our Savior this morning. And if you don't, today can be the day so I can talk here in a minute about what can come your way. If Jesus has forgiven you, and he has, amen? amen. He's forgiven you for all that you have done we need to step up and accept it. Don't continue to carry it around. Don't continue to say, well, you know, I'm saved, but oh man, you don't know the kind of person and you don't know the things that I did. My daughter used to say, come on, build a bridge and get over it, okay? <laughs> now that may sound unkind, but the fact is, what are you doing? You're calling God a liar. If you're continuing to carry around that old you, that old stuff you did that Jesus has forgotten, you know, it's an amazing thing to consider. When scripture says that God is going to separate us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. Now, this is a, a theological conundrum in my mind, but it's, it, that tells me that if I get, when, not if, when I get to heaven <laughs> and I'm standing before God and I, if I have occasion to say to him, Lord, I'm sorry about that thing I did, God, the uh, omniscient, all-knowing God is going to say, what, what are you talking about? You know, there are scriptures that says he chooses to forget your past, those sins that he has forgiven. So if, if, you are, if you know him as Savior, then follow him as Lord and leave the past in the past. And then second, guys, recognize that God is in control of what's coming tomorrow and your worrying about it, your anxiety about it is not going to make one bit of difference. And in fact, it's going to hurt. It wastes time. It wastes energy. So stop it. Cast your cares upon him, as the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 5.18. So again, Jesus is not saying, don't make money. Don't have nice things. You don't, there's, no, uh, there's no virtue in a vow of poverty. If that's what God's called you to, then great. But, but that's, it's not like the poor are better or worse. It just is. And he is saying here, though, to put our faith and put our trust it, it is in your money, it, not in, anybody. he is saying, do not put your faith and your trust in your money and in your nice things. He's not saying we shouldn't think about the future. And in fact, as we've seen, planning for the tomorrow is important. It, it's not only important, it's biblical. Luke 14, Jesus says, for which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish it, 
all who are watching will begin to ridicule him, saying, this person began to build and was not able to finish. So make your plans. Organize things. Make sure things are going well. But worrying, on the other hand, is just time wasted. So what's the difference between the two? Well, careful planning, thinking ahead, thinking about your goals and your steps and, 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 and your desired outcome and your schedules, and then trusting in God's guidance. In, in fact, good planning is a good thing because it can often prevent worry. If I hadn't spent the week studying and putting together this message, I would have probably been pretty worried this morning. What am I going to say when I get up there? If I, if I just sort of walk, I know some of you might think I just walk up here and just start talking. No, I put a lot of work into this. And it keeps me from worrying. Worriers, on the other hand, are consumed. They are strangled by fear. And when you live like that, it's hard to trust in God. It interferes with your relationship with God. He wants us to be free, again, within the limits that he's provided. So seek first his kingdom, his power in your life, his control in your life, and his righteousness. And don't remain chained up like I had to do to Cooper. You were born again to be wild. So put your faith and your trust in God. Why? Because he does know what's coming. He knows what you're going to be facing, and he's going to give you what you need for it. Jesus freed us so we could make those choices to follow him because it's only, guys, in following Jesus that we find the freedom from those chains of worry and anxiety and, and the struggles that we put ourselves through. And this morning, I don't know if you've experienced that or not. If you haven't, then we talk here about the ABCs, the importance of recognizing your need of a Savior. And I'm not saying you need a Savior because you worry. I'm saying you need a Savior because we all need a Savior. We were born into this world separated from God. The wages of sin is death. And, 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 uh, and we have all been separated from God and we all owe those wages. And that death that he's talking about there is separation from him. It's a spiritual separation from God. But Jesus Christ came and he died on a cross, not for his own sins, but for my sins and for your sins. He paid that price. He paid the wages for my sin so that I don't have to. And B of the ABCs, A is admit your need of Christ. B is to believe that Jesus paid the price. And C is to make a choice, Amen. is to accept the gift. Thank you, Lord, for paying that price. Come into my life. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. I want to follow you. I want to live by your ways. And this morning, if you have never done that, today can be the day of salvation. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I can't encourage you enough that if you haven't done this, do it today and experience a whole new level of life. Today can be the day. Let me give you a couple of takeaways for uh, this message this morning. The first one is this. As I look at this passage, I ask myself, of course, do money worries keep me up at night? Honestly, yes, at times they do. And I'm not proud of that. And so what do I do about it? Lord, Ephesians 5.18, Lord, take control of my life. Come into my life. Fill me with your spirit, Lord. This is not how you want me to live. I need your power to live in faith and trust in you. So yeah, money worries do keep me up at nights. Number two, do my things own me? Oh man, do they ever? <laughs> do I let them? Yes, I do. And so it's encouraging to recognize, put your things in their place. Let them be the things. Let them, let them serve you. Don't you continuously serve them. Maybe sometimes you, you figure out, I got too many things. I'm, I'm, I almost said I was a hoarder, and I know people will say that I am. I just save things. <laughs> and I have in the past, I, I'm growing though, because I have begun to feel the, the, the freedom of giving things away <laughs> and not having so much stuff so that I, there's not so many things that are out there to own me. And number three, of course, does the future scare me? Well, sometimes, yeah. And once again, that's the point at which I recognize I'm not allowing God's spirit to fill me and control me and empower me. Because 2 Timothy 1.7 reminds us that God has not given us a spirit of fear 
but rather of power and love and discipline. Everything we're talking about. You may sit there and think, man, that sounds amazing. I, I, don't, I don't know that I could ever do that. Well, let me tell you, you can't, okay? That's why God sent his Holy Spirit to empower us, to indwell us. And if you know him this morning, that power is available, but you have to access it. You have to give him control in your life. I pray this morning that above all else, the number one ambition that we have is what verse 33 says, to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Amen? Amen. Father, I pray that's exactly what we want to do this morning. I, Lord, I will just say for myself, and I pray my brothers and sisters would agree with me, I want to recommit myself this morning to seeking after you. Because so often, Lord, I do allow worry and anxiety to strangle me and to strangle my relationship with you. Lord, I have some real issues in my life at times, and you know that. But you have promised, Lord, to give me that peace that passes understanding, that peace that that doesn't make sense in light of what I'm going through, that peace that others in my world will see and then cause them to ask me the reason for the hope that I have in the midst of even a hopeless situation. Father, that's what I want, more so than I want to to be characterized as a person who's worried and anxious all the time. And And so because of that, Lord... I cast my cares upon you. I want to look to you only. I want you to fill me with your spirit and so fill me then also with your peace. Bring people into my life, into our lives, Lord, that can encourage us and hold us accountable to these commitments we've made. And those people are called the church. It's why we gather together like this. It's why, it's why, why Lord, I get together in life groups. Help me to put my complete focus upon you first, Lord. I want my treasure to be where my heart is. So change me, Lord, from the inside out. And I'll give you the praise and the glory for all that results. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Willie, for the great message and great advice. Now let's stand and worship.
Hakuna Matata. Right? No worries. No worries, right? None of us in here struggle with worrying. We're all good. No, I'm just kidding. I'm sure most of us struggle with worry at some point. Man, was today's message ever so convicting for me and I'm sure for others in this room. One, one verse that Pastor Willie shared that really stuck out was the passage in Timothy uh, 6, chapter 6, um, verse 17. It says, instruct those who are rich in the present world not to be uh, consecrated or set on their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Now, I'm not rich by any means, um, but I've been convicted lately. Uh, our family is going through a little bit of a hard time, and I found myself rather than, sorry, rather than setting my focus on the Lord, I found hope with buying stuff. So it was buying new furniture and new things and trying to feel fulfilled or hopeful in those things. And man, was I convicted. Whew. I'm going to pray and, and dismiss this all. Father God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your son. We thank you that we can set our hope on you. That we can look forward to who you are in our relationship with you. And we can walk right alongside you. We pray these things in your heavenly name. Amen. Have a blessed week, everybody.